there are many of you here who we may not all know each other. Um, let's just as commissioners all introduce ourselves so you know who we are. My name is Kasha Ranjo. I am the chair of the Parks Commission. I'm Lincoln Frasca. Andrew Brewer. And then I believe um, Stephanie is also on the commission. She's unable to make it tonight. And then Dan Dickerson is also on the commission. He will, I'm sure, be here very shortly. Um, and then Alec here is our parks director, who I'm, I think many of you know because he keeps this place in great shape. Um, I um, let's get started with um, calling us to order um, and let's approve the agenda and six seven twenty agenda and six fifteen minutes. Any discussion? I'm looking at you two <laughs> on the agenda or minutes. No. Okay. Oh, no. Then I need a motion. Motion. Okay. Lincoln. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Um, and next, I'd like to open it up for public comment and be clear that we are discussing the. Um, proposed um, city encampment policies just after this. So if you have comments on that, please hold that. If you are here with any other public comment, I invite you to share. And yes. Uh, briefly, I'd like to call the meeting warning is uh, possibly needing improvement. Uh, I believe all boards and commissions within the city are supposed to post their meeting warnings uh, in City Hall on one of the bulletin boards, either the one in John Odom's clerk's office or the one in the main hallway. Okay, I was not aware of that. Um, and we will do a better job of that with maybe some city support on that. Thanks. You just come right here. Um, anything else? <laughs> I just had a question. Yeah. Has the City ended the support for the, the doggy bags in terms of supplying doggy bags to the different locations here in the park. Alec, he literally we'll right just oh, printed that oh, one. This is Hi. Dan Dickerson, also Hi, the Parks Commission. Um, I do not know, but we will ask Dan about that. Alec, yeah, Alec. I mean, Alec. <laughs> um, good question. Um, anything else before we move on to, I think, the main, main act tonight? I uh, have one more. Yes. Uh, the pocket park, we, I've tried to get that power washed uh, for weeks upon weeks, and uh, as well as the cleanup and the mowing of the effluent park. Uh, it, there seems to be confusion talking to Public Works. They say that y'all handle the parks, but then there's the p opposite park, uh, the other side of the pedestrian bridge that's five feet tall now and people are walking their dogs and not picking up after them because they can't find it and okay. so those are park maintenance issues and i'm just concerned that uh there's ambiguity as to who's responsible did if you say park, did you say effluent park i did call it Wait, what is park. effluent park it's confluence park is okay. the uh oh. effluent park. Uh, but the 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 can't call it anything that it is the, the vomit the feces the urine in that's occurred in the pocket park necessitates power washing okay. even more so when there's it's being used um i we will make sure that alec is aware of that i don't know about the day-to-day -day maintenance of a park so we will figure that out thank you for letting yeah. us know um i'm going to move us along to the city camping memo and policy um and, we, and I'll turn things over to Cameron with the city in one second. I just want to open up by saying, just like starting with a couple assumptions here. One is that I think every single person here, we can assume we all care about people. And two, I think we all care about our parks. So I just want to set that tone for this evening. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming and for and, and for investing in this community and caring about the future of this place. And this kind of participation is really important. So thank you for being here. Um, I also want, uh, this is an opportunity for us as a commission um, to learn and discuss and to ensure that the city policy is mindful of park management needs and existing park policy. 
And I just so all of you are aware, the first that many of us heard of this was an article in the bridge a couple weeks ago, and we had not been involved previously. And so this for, for us is a learning opportunity for us to hear what the city has in mind, to ask questions, and and um, and is a learning opportunity for us as well. Um, so I just want you all to be aware of where we are as a commission and our involvement with the proposed policy. Um, and so tonight I want to turn it over to Cameron, who I think will share a little bit about the need and the why um, from the city perspective this is needed, an overview of the policy of the, of the what would happen um, and the timeline and um, hopefully also the decision makers and what would happen with this policy. Um, and then we'll have space for the commissioners to ask questions because this is our first space to have this discussion as a commission. And then we'll turn it over um, to the public for uh, you know questions and comments and concerns and things like that. Um, so let's first start with Cameron. Um, so take it away. All right. So I'm going to try to project really loudly so if you can't hear me, just holler. Hold on one second. I forgot yep. something. I would love to know who all is here. So I'm going to take this little piece of paper and hand it around. Um, if you, each of you don't mind, just write your name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, you want a clipboard? Oh. Okay. Clipboard? Oh, a and a clipboard. <laughs> Look how organized. Yeah. Oh, that'd be helpful. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Karen. Sorry. Thank you. So, I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm excited to see a lot of folks in person. I moved here to take the assistant city manager job uh, two years ago now, about, and right before COVID locked us down. So, I haven't been able to meet a lot of folks, so I'm really happy to see you all here, and I appreciate it. So, um, I'm going to walk through the presentation that we plan to give to Council tomorrow um, because I think it answers a lot of questions um, and addresses some concerns that I've heard from folks and addresses a lot of the conversation that I've seen publicly happening about this policy, why it even exists. So tonight I'd really like to talk about why we even tried to make a policy, what the purpose of this policy even is, um, talk about what outreach and feedback we have received, talk about what the community impact may be what questions and answers I may have that have already come up a few times, so maybe it'll answer some of your questions, and then talk about what our next steps are for the city. So really talking about why this policy was even written, um, we, uh, well, let me back up a step and say, what is this policy? What is it even trying to do? What are we here to talk about? So the city has drafted something we're calling City of Montpelier Encampment Response Policy, which tries to understand um, sort of our legal responsibilities as the city um, and what our responsibilities are to folks who are emergency camping because of homelessness and what our response will be internally as staff dealing with those encampments. So mostly we're trying to balance what our legal responsibilities are and what we should be doing as staff to remain uh, responsive to folks, connect people to services, and have a very clear understanding of what staff should be doing so that people can hold us accountable. So that's really why or what the policy even is. So why we needed to write this. A lot of you may know that uh, the state has been hosting a hotel motel program in town and in our surrounding areas that have brought a lot of uh, folks who did not previously live here to stay in our community house. Now they've ended that program and don't really have an exit plan for folks. And so there are people who don't have a plan for housing. They don't have couches to sleep on. They don't have friends to stay with. They don't have family to stay with. They can't afford the hotels anymore. And there's not enough housing or supportive housing for them to go to. And so they turn to emergency camping. And um, those numbers have increased because of the end of the hotel motel program. Um, there was a case out of Boise, Idaho, that um, is called Martin v. Boise. And I'm sorry, I'm getting heat up as we stand here. Um, which sets legal precedent. So what the case was, was really ruling that enforcement of ordinances, city and municipal ordinances, that prohibit sleeping or camping on public property um, against homeless individuals or those who do not have shelter is unconstitutional if those people do not have a shelter to go to. So we just talked a little bit about how the motel, pro motel hotel program has ended and a lot of people don't have shelter. Well, what about the shelters that we have in our community, like Good Samaritan Haven? Well, they're full, and there's no place for people to go. So um, 
that court case really shows that there is a constitutional uh, uh, responsibility of the city um, there. So people can be offered appropriate available shelter space, like if our, part, our sheltering partners have space available, but if they don't go there, then they could be cited under this, law, uh, under this law. So I have gotten some feedback that said this law doesn't, like this ruling doesn't apply to us. It's in a different court district. It doesn't apply to us. I think that that's not a very proactive way to look at this. I think that um, while this case has not, the Supreme Court did not take up this case, that still leaves this law uh, case, the Martin v. Boise case, as the highest law precedent in the country. So if anything was tried, this would be what it was held against, right? So what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, our policy is um, responding to the Martin v. Boise case in a proactive way and not a reactive way. So um, I'll sort of go over again sort of where we're at. The hotel motel program is ended. I've been talking to our peer outreach worker and she expects probably, she told me last time, probably 20 folks that she does not know what plan they have for exiting the hotel motels, right? No other place for them to go. Um, general assistance housing, like what you call the state for and get connected to in the state, um, has returned to pre-COVID eligibility restrictions, which really severely limits who is eligible for housing. And when I say severely limits, um, usually it's for weather emergencies, for folks who have families and for women and children which leaves a huge swath of folks out of being eligible for general assistance housing. So that means there will be an increased number of people experiencing homelessness in our community needing a place to go because there is a limited shelter and housing capacity in our area. So um, I'll sort of make a plug here because I just said that um, people will be turning to emergency camping. How can we support them? Just know that some of our partner agencies in town, like Good Samaritan and Another Way, are doing drives for supplies for folks if you feel like getting involved that way. And our homelessness task force does have an incidental fund to give people, tie people over for emergency supplies if you're at all interested in getting involved that way. So, getting back to the policy. Um, to respond to community need and our legal responsibilities, the proposed policy, which we built off a local model from Hartford, Vermont, was created in partnership with the MPD, our park staff, our cemetery staff, our fire department, our health department through the fire department, planning, recreation, and my office in the city manager's office. So we've talked to our legal team, Hartford, Vermont, our homelessness task force has talked about this at length the Cemetery Commission, the Recreation Advisory Board, and here we are at the Parks Commission, looking for feedback because that's what this is about. So what the policy actually says, right? Since emergency camping is defined as legal on public land, if somebody does not have an alternate shelter option, it's necessary that the city has a policy that outlines what our staff should do in case of an encampment, right? So that we know and the community knows what we plan on doing. It emphasizes a model of non-interference, which I think is why a lot of folks are here, right? So the policy aims to outline spaces where we don't wanna see camping because of a variety of reasons. It could be unsafe for staff, could be unsafe for campers, could be considered unsafe for the community in general, right? So it, um, unless the policy states that unless we see people camping in those high, high sensitivity areas, it's a general non-interference. The policy says, so if Alec runs into somebody camping far off in the woods when he's maintaining trees or something, uh, leave them alone and contact the city manager's office who will then put them in touch with the peer support outreach worker, which we pay for through the Good Samaritan Haven. And that person is gonna be able to talk to somebody, talk to that person, help them, connect them to services, sort of explain how they can find housing in an emergency situation. So it really focuses on connecting people to emergency camping support and social service agencies so that they can get the help that they need. What it also does is outlines times where that might not be okay. Like if somebody is causing a public health hazard or a trash hazard or something that we see as unacceptable per the, the stipulations in the policy, we can ask them to relocate or help them mitigate their, the, the issue, right? So if there's trash, we can help them clean it up. If 
something else is going on, we can help them find alternatives. And um, that's outlined in the policy. So I think what the political side of this and why we're coming to meetings like the Parks Commission and talking to folks is that um, this policy goes a little beyond what I have the authority to do, right? I, my office can write policies that tell staff, here's how you will respond. But what this policy is also trying to do is say where in Montpelier we're asking folks not to locate a camp, right? So we came up with a list. That list was, um, I'll sort of go into it now. We came up with that list sort of based on um, uh, city staff expertise, noticing where people, where there's flash floods, where things can um, harm folks. So we said like, don't camp in the waterways, don't camp next to schools, don't camp. I'm gonna actually read this whole list to you so you can hear it. Schools and adjoining grounds, licensed daycare facilities, including our city-run camps, on our multi-use paths, on walking, biking trails and paths in all city parks, on wetlands, waters, and waterways, so folks aren't at risk of a flash flood, um, within 50 feet of a property boundary of a residence or business, unless permitted by the owner, within 50 feet of a property boundary of a playground, soccer field, baseball field, basketball court, tennis court, or golf course. If the encampment includes an individual who's a registered sex offender, we've asked them to extend that boundary to 2,000 feet. Uh, we've also included the city's water resource recovery facility and the water treatment plant as places we would like people not to camp. And the cemetery commission also added on cemetery plots, paths, or roads. Additional locations that I've heard people bring up wanting council to consider, uh, adding to the list of banned uh, camping includes the 12 main Moat lot that we just put grass on. And I know that the conversation has been really heated about Hubbard Park. So, I wanna sort of go over what the impacts might be of this policy. Um, we believe that having a policy like this in place gives clarity to the city's rules about camping and where we expect it to happen because we have to acknowledge that it will happen and is happening and has been happening. So it protects emergency campers, the community, and the city. It clearly explains what the city's expectations are of those who are camping and what our responses will be and it communicates what property is considered a high sensitivity area that we just went over to sort of tell people where they can't be. And it holds our staff to a standard. So if folks are camping and they are approached by staff, they know what they'll be getting from that inter encounter, right? So um, let's see. What the policy does is try to respond to our legal responsibility by the Martin v. Boise case. Uh, like I just said, it communicates our expectations to both the community and folks who are camping and staff. And it really does do that political line where, set, where it says the city will not accept camping in these areas, and here's why. What it doesn't do is allow for camping within those high sensitivity areas. It does not allow for camping for non-emergency reasons. So there's no change to the ordinance except understanding that camping has to ha be able to occur in city property um, in emergency uh, for emergency reasons when people do not have any other shelter opportunities. It also does not create any permissions for illegal activity. Illegal activity, still illegal activity. However, I say that with a caveat because something I do want to get out into the public and make people aware of, and this is a great opportunity to do that, is our local state, our state attorney, Rory Tebow, has recently made clarifying statements on how his office will be handling things uh, like he, this is his words, not mine, the homeless, transient, and vulnerable population, which limits the amount of inter infractions that his office is going to prosecute. They have told us very clearly they will not be prosecuting major, minor property crimes, such as unlawful trespass or theft, or um, crimes that are occurring with folks that are uh, individuals struggling with poverty and homelessness. So he's going to be taking into account crimes of necessity versus one for personal gain. Um, so you can consider that as our trespassing orders for not camping or for camping anywhere. It's going to be severely limited if we don't have a policy to fall back on because our state attorney has basically said he will not be prosecuting these low level offenses for folks who are experiencing homelessness. He's also made it very clear that he's sees um, things like traditional police responses as not good enough in situations like this, and we agree. 
which is why this policy really outlines a group effort of how we will be connecting people to services instead of just saying, this is not where you can be, please leave. It's if they're camping somewhere we've already established is not okay for camping. It's this is not okay, here's where else you can go, here's how we can connect you to services. And it's not just the police, it's the peer support outreach worker that we pay for through Good Samaritan Haven, and it's also our social worker that we pay for and partner with with Barry and our police officers. So we have, a, and, and, more, and many more, we have a lot of community partners and agencies that help us with this. So we're really not trying to make this a, a hammer response. It's a no but, it's a no and, it's a no how can we help you. So I know this is a lot, so thanks for sticking with me. So I'm gonna go into a Q&A section because I know and I've been monitoring a lot of the questions and um, I would like to open it up for commissioners to have um, discussion first and yeah. then open up to the public. Oh, That's no, okay. I, I, was, she, she's I have, still oh, I have some common oh, Q&As. Okay, Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. So I just want to address um, <laughs> some questions that have been coming up in a lot of okay, conversations. Great. So hopefully this maybe answers some of y'all's questions and um, sort of helps make some clarity. So does this allow residents to camp wherever they want on public land? No, it does not. It is our city's responsibility to allow emergency camping on public, specific public lands that we've outlined if no shelter space is available. I have a home here, I can't camp here because I have somewhere to go. So this doesn't change our no camping ordinance in our parks for those who have shelter available to them. Um, I've heard how will this impact park participation? I will say again, because I think it bears repeating, I think a lot of people aren't aware of this, but there has been camping happening in our public land, in our public parks for years. This is an ongoing systemic issue that this does not purport to solve, but I want to make sure that everyone is aware that this has been happening and will continue to happen. We're just trying to put some limits on it so people understand what those limits are. So um, it doesn't really change things and how you day-to-day -day interact with the park. Um, you know, I've asked, I've been asked how are people with dogs going to interact with people. I will just remind folks that we have laws about keeping your dog within verbal control. And if you see illegal activity, report it to our police officers. So does this uh, policy adequately address hygiene concerns? No, it does not. And it does not purport to, nor does it solve this issue. It does only provide an outline for determining mitigating strategies for any public health concerns concerns at any identified campsite and we know and are aware that city does not the city does not have public facilities that are not limited in hours and locations and we're looking to our newly formed public restroom committee from the council for recommendations on that uh, this policy doesn't do enough to end or address root causes of homelessness we agree with that it does not it only really tries to address what staff will be doing and how we respond to folks who are camping so I already talked about that. This is a long presentation, I'm very sorry. And then, why do this at all? Why have a policy? So I said, camping's already happening. Camping will continue to happen. We're just hoping to have a policy that puts some parameters around that and explain to staff how they will be responding to those encampments. Um, you know, if, if uh, our elected bodies do not wish to pass this full thing, you know, staff will still need to have an internal response policy, but it will not have any way to enforce it. There won't be any enforcement for where is okay to camp, where isn't. We legally, and I would argue morally, need to offer that to folks in our community because this isn't folks who want to camp. This is an, uh, an end, of, end of options option for a lot of folks, right? So I would argue that morally and legally, we should offer locations for people to camp. And so this allows us to build parameters around that. Um, there is a map of what uh, property the city's proposed um, policy has considered not in high sensitivity areas. Uh, it is a bad map. I'm working on getting um, a, a consultant to help me with maps. Um, our maps are for tax property boundaries, not so much aesthetics. So I'll sort of tell you where where this sort of means, if you will. So we have our rec field, um, which is where the volleyball net is, um, across the bridge going into um, uh, North Branch Park. So North Branch Park, Dog River Field. Um, right now it includes Hubbard Park and North Branch. 
Blanchard and the Mill Street, Elm Street Park, Greenmount Cemetery, Elm Street Cemetery, 12 Main, and the Stump Dump. Our next steps, because, and the policy doesn't preclude any of this, if it passes or not, but is continuing work with our community partners, like our peer outreach worker through Good Samaritan Haven. We've currently funded that through 2023. We continue to work with the Washington County Homelessness Action Team, which is trying to bring a bunch of different organizations together to solve this sort of holistically. We would receive support and guidance through our Homelessness Task Force and the Public Restroom Committee that's just getting started. We would seek clarity from the state on how they will be addressing emergency camping on their land because there is a lot of state-owned land in our community as well. We would advocate for more state funding and services to support those experiencing homelessness. And um, I, I have been told that the council would like to hear from um, someone from the state to come to us and talk to us about what their ongoing plans are for addressing homelessness in our community. So we're recommending a staff, after all of that, to council to look at this policy, make amends as needed, hear the recommendations from their other elected bodies, like the Parks Commission here, and um, uh, pass the policy as amended as needed so that staff and the community have a clear understanding of how we will be addressing emergency encampments. So um, there's a lot of options there and there's a lot going on. And I just wanna thank everyone for being here. This is a really big deal that you're here to talk about this issue at all. Um, I'm just happy that this conversation I think has led to a lot of folks understanding that this is a true problem in Montpelier and doesn't just address surrounding areas. So thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Now I'm done. All right, well, thank you, Cameron. I appreciate it. I'd like to invite the commissioners here with questions, Dan. Um, I, I can think of several that I want to ask, but um, I think at least the most important question in my mind, at least right off the bat, is where where does our authority lie and where is our authority basically non-existent? And, and so in my mind, and, and Cameron, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the ordinance, you know, for the parks states that nobody shall be in the parks after dusk or, or before dawn um, unless authorized by the Parks Commission. So, you know, I think, you know, the policy aside, which I don't, I mean, we could certainly make recommendations. I don't think we can outright reject it and then it's rejected. I mean, that's just the council prerogative, but, you know, we, we can basically say, um, you know, either no park should be on this list, every park should be on this list, or, or we can pick and choose. And I think that's really where our decision-making authority lies. Is, is that about right? So that would be, um, so yes and no. Um, yes, in that we I want to hear the recommendations of that, right, to add that or not to add that. I think we'd also, if we took every park's parcel off of this, would no longer be offering reasonable locations, alternate locations, which is mandated under this, this law. So um, I think that you need to really think about what that means for folks, taking off all um, parks. Um, you know, Hubbard Park was on our initial list of staff because it has facilities. They're not adequate, but they have facilities and the other parks don't. Um, so, uh, you know, you make any recommendations that you would like to make and I will take those. Um, but um, in accordance to uh, Martin B. Boise, the ordinances are moot in, in face of this. In the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and I, I in mean, the Ninth Circuit, they're moot. moot in some ways in that if we don't provide anything, then we're wrong. But if we, you know, I, I guess there's an argument to be made, well, if we, if we provide space in certain places, but not maybe every place on this list. And I, and I will correct myself and say, I wouldn't have recommended that we remove all parks. I mean, I think, I think we have to be, you know, malleable just like everybody else does. But I will say, I don't, I don't know that we necessarily have to provide everything and, and yet we're still, um, you know, not, uh, you know, we could, we could give some um, space and still not run afoul of, of the court precedent from a different district. Is, right. is that okay? Yes, that's true. Thank you. And that's totally your prerogative. And I, you know, I, again, I do want to recognize that yes, it is in another space. I certainly don't, I think it's a, a, a good law. Our legal counsel says that, you know, it's good to be proactive here. This is the prevailing highest court holding to this decision. And I 
to be honest, don't want to be a test kitchen for that. Um, I think you had some questions about the Ninth Circuit Court, it sounded like. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm really trying to think that through. Um, I, I, I want to be guided what the law is right here, right now, and it's not a Ninth Circuit Court decision. Um, I don't, I don't want to make a decision based on the fear of, of a Supreme Court decision somewhere down the road that we might run afoul of, which is what it would take at this point for a Ninth Circuit Court decision to to uh, guide what we have to, the law here. Um, that, that's just you know, I, I'm, I'm to follow up on what Dan said. It's not to say that I'm. I think it's 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 it probably is a good law, and I, I did read it, um, and it's certainly an aspirational law that we could try to follow and hold up to. But my point is that here tonight, I, I'm not guided by that. So in terms of in terms of a legal decision that we have to make. So from this, my understanding is that the Ninth Circuit court decision is non-binding, and Montpelier is not obligated nor required. That's right. To follow that court decision, but Montpelier is choosing to. We are recommending, a, staff is recommending to council that they put uh, parameters around this so we know how to respond to it. Yes. Okay. If, if, um, if I may? Yes. Correct. We are not going to go against that law. That's a, that's the law of the land right now. So so if, it, even though it happened in the Ninth Circuit Court, it, it, it's it's the law of the land. It's the precedent of what's going on right now. In the Ninth Circuit. I don't think that, Circuit. I don't know if she's, is that right? It's, no, it's not. It's yeah, I don't not, think that's right. If you look at the, any yeah. of the law reviews, Harvard Law Review, on that specific case, it'll, it'll mention that there's it's somewhat bracketed. Is, 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 is how I'm running my department, I'm considering it a precedent. And, and, and when you add that to our conversations with the state's attorney's office, this is the only thing we're doing is just giving you the information as to what we can or cannot do or how we limit ourselves and what our operations are. Okay. Um, cause it, um, I just want to be clear on that because it seems that that when I read through the purpose of the policy, much of the purpose is to meet our obligation under the Ninth Circuit Court's decision. And if the Ninth Circuit Court decision is not binding, I am not sure that language should be in our policy or the reasoning behind it. And I, I just one thing that didn't get mentioned is that it was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court declined to, to review right. it. So that has a higher level of precedent. Okay. Um, and I just want we to. to the Ninth Circuit. What Correct. The to them, to the Ninth State, no less. Yeah. Um, and other questions from the commissioners? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I could ask one more. So I, in, in a scenario, you know, let's say we have someone camping in a park, you know, is, is generally in, you know, abiding by the policy that we've set out here, assuming it's not amended. And then we have another instance where, you know, let's say there's, there's a campsite and it's surrounded by trash. If, if park staff, um, I guess, could you just walk me through, I, I think you gave the scenario mm -hmm. roughly where, you know, everything's fine and, and Alec basically walks away, but I guess, can you just walk through both of those scenarios again exactly, you know, is Alec going to report, you know, in any way, you know, uh, the presence of, of someone or? Yes. Okay. So, um, I'll go through some of the specific language if that's okay. So, um, if a city staff member, the way we're writing this is if a staff member identifies a campsite, they'll report it to my office and the police department. We're going to connect that if that, if that location is fine and in a, a non-high sensitivity area, right? We're going to report that to our peer support outreach worker who we pay right now and they'll be able to work with them and connect them to services that way we know the location of where that person is in case there's an emergency and um, we can connect them to services through a non-confrontational uh, way right if there is a report of a um, non-compliant or uh, camp in a high sensitivity area we're asking staff to um, I want to not quote incorrectly, so let me go through this. So what we'll do is ask staff to contact my office, the police department, and what we would be doing is calling our partners and going to that location and talking to them, really, is the first step, is making sure that they're offered um, services available for the state. If there's shelter, connect them to shelter. Because I want to make it very clear that this policy is only if there is no other shelter available, right? So if there is shelter, we can send them to that or 
choose to do any of the things within our power, like cite them for trespassing, etc. Right? It's not really what we want to do, but it's something that is within our power to do. So we have a response form that we'd be pulling out um, that's included in this to say what we did. We would base on the above compliance factors that we've outlined in this um, policy, determine if the encampment is um, in an incorrect area or it's non-compliant. And if it is not compliant, we will um, either ask the person to leave voluntarily, uh, refer the individuals to our community justice center, talk to Rory Tebow, use our other um, policing uh, powers there, uh, post the area against trespassing, mitigate the site to remove public health hazards, um, and then if the encampment is actually on private land, we'll be working with the landowners as well. So, um, and then we'd be doing an after action meeting to make sure we did a good job, and if we didn't, why, and what can we do to fix it? So really it's ask someone to move or facilitate the removal of that location. Okay. But, but concerning park staff in both cases, oh, their, they're, their they're involvement separated. is very minimal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, right. no. We don't. They, don't, they, they, they would never have to, you know, confront somebody or, no. or talk. Okay. No confrontations. As I read it, I thought it said staff and defined it as park staff and then said if the encampment is in a high sensitivity area, staff, meaning park staff, would ask the camper to leave, would post that they the date that they had asked them to leave. So, would the, come so back there's and clean up the site. Yeah, so there's that incorrect? Yes. Uh, so uh, there's another policy, so this becomes a bigger thing because I squished a bunch of stuff together and I'm sorry I feel like that confused a lot of folks. That's my bad. I've learned. But we have an appendix to this policy. If a campsite is abandoned, which is a whole nother story, then yes, camp, we are allowing staff to uh, go to that location, post a notice, say, hey, you gotta, you gotta clean this up. And if it's not cleaned up, we will, as the city, go and pick that stuff up and hold it for a certain amount of time while posting a letter to say, here's where your stuff's at. Which has been in that. place for years. Yeah. Successfully. That's, that's an older policy. Just felt like it for completion needed to be all together. How often you have to do that? Very rarely. Okay. I asked how often he does that, so very rarely. That kind of goes into a question I had, which is like, what is the current staff, park staff response plan to an encampment that might be in the park property, low sensitive area as defined here, and discreet? You know, what, what are we doing now already? I don't know if there, is, well, there isn't a policy. There, there isn't, isn't a policy, policy is the answer to that question. As, as, as far as what we do now, you know, we have a policy for um, unattended campsites, but when people are there, you know, our best practice is to refer it to PD. Um, it happens so rarely that it's not something that we've ever sought to have a we like really written formal policy on. Um, I actually can't even remember one single instance where I came upon a campsite that was not already abandoned. Um, I, so I have a question about that. It seems like the purpose of the policy is to decriminalize, which I get is the part where the attorney has said, we're not going to prosecute people for being homeless, et cetera, et cetera, and legitimize, which I believe is essentially to say parks are open for camping except in high sensitivity areas. For folks who are homeless who, folks who are do homeless. not have an alternative shelter. So that's the key point. Like if Good Sam is open and they're being disruptive and we find them, that allows us under the law to, to ask them to leave. Um, how are you determining which encampment is a homeless person and which encampment is not homeless person? It's a good question. Um, what is the plan for disposal of human waste? Um, I've been in contact with Hartford, Vermont, which I said has been doing this, and they've connected me to um, uh, contractors who do that for work, for a living. If that is a problem that we've identified and our public health officer identifies that as a problem, we can get someone to clean that up. I can assure you that if people are dispersed camping where there is no human waste disposal, that will be a problem. We're not arguing sure. with that. Okay. Um, and. I, um, in terms of the high sensitivity areas, um, there's only one mention in the list of natural resources, which is wetlands, waters, and waterways. And as I heard it described now, the concern is that in fact it is not damage to the resource, but in fact risk to the person. And in my 
my frame of mind when I think of high sensitive areas. I think of ecological communities, sensitive plant communities, those types of things, and I'm wondering how those have been taken into consideration. That's why we're here. Um, you know, our staff definitely put the people first in the conversation, so that's why we're here to hear any recommendations that y'all may have. And then how would a camper know where high sensitive areas are located? So we have a communication plan I've been talking with, with our peer outreach worker and um, especially on the homelessness task force and our Washington County action team for um, addressing homelessness about getting this message out. Where would we post it? Where would it be? Do we get maps out? How do we, how do we communicate this if it, if it does go into effect? So we have been talking about that. Are you, are you, or I guess Good Samaritan or the, or the state, um, is, is someone aware of, you know, the at-risk population and sort of in touch with them in some way, or, you know, is there, are there some people that could just show up and not know anything about what the city has in place? Yes, that's true. They could. Um, but I would, our, I would say that right now, um, our peer, our, 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 our um, partner agencies who do social services are aware of, of who would be impacted by this, yes. So I, I understand you're working on a, on a communication plan for identifying these highly sensitive areas. Can you at least give us an idea of you know what you think that might look like? I mean, you start with a, a big chunk of property. So I'm, I'm, I, I feel like, no, that's not what I was saying. I, I have a communication plan for okay. explaining to folks when we've reached what the high sensitive okay. areas are. This is my outreach to understand what high sensitivity areas okay. are. Right now, they were staff, and now I've been I've been contacted the the various boards and um, committees that deal with the affected properties to talk to okay. them about it. Um, I, I it seems to me that the city is ready to move forward with this policy, and that our space as a commission is to maybe help them define the high sensitive areas and ask for services like human waste disposal and those types of things to mitigate the effects to the park. Does that sound right? Um, so what can we do as a commission to help them understand what a high sensitivity area is? Well, I think that maybe that's where I was going with my question. I mean, it's, it's uh, like I said, you start with a big chunk of property, but if you go every time you go down one of these bullet points, that property gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding. You know, is there going to be a map? Is there going to be? Yes, okay. there will be a map. Okay. Yes. Um, Oh, but even even if there's a map, if we if we shrink it down and say, well, this slope here and, right. and this little wetland right. there is off limits. I mean, you know, is, do we really we expect our homeless population to be savvy right. to like, I'm you know? Saying, and, I'm not gonna, yeah. No, yeah, yeah and so it's it's a tough, you know, it's a tough cookie to, yeah. Yeah. however the saying is, crumble craft. I'll add, Kasha, though, that your question earlier is. Um, something that speaks to me and something when we talk about high sensitivity areas and it, yes, you know, Cameron's approach was around people, but understanding proximity to waterways and issues that we have e with e, e. coli in our rivers. Um, and it's something I've already to, reached out to Cameron about. So I, I wouldn't be so quick to say that it's a foregone conclusion, but I think it's, you know, there's still a lot of conversation to have around what you know how we're defining these boundaries and obviously yes enforcement it becomes a whole nother level of how do we manage that but i think that that's still on the table and part of the conversation and i don't want to lose sight of that um and then uh, would you, were you gonna ask something oh i just had a thought just about like multiple uses in the park regardless and how timing you know if you come to hubbard park at five or six a.m it's a much different experience than if you come at high noon on a saturday and could like there be a temporal limit on camping in certain high sensitive areas that maybe other are sensitive because the community is out there and maybe the tent or encampment is allowed from dusk to dawn. Mm -hmm. Our legal counsel said we could put time limits on it. And then who would be responsible for enforcing those, I guess would be the next question. That's it for that. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be, I think, something that could potentially my mind work out better than just open open country so to speak i think i'm most concerned about damage to the resource which is the natural communities of the parks off trail you know like people walking off trail and creating social paths that then become long-term paths because they are established and that's 
we our parks have a history of social trails turning into paths and um, uh, human waste disposal, what's going to happen there. It, that is a big problem for our parks. And my concern, I guess, with dispersing use is that we have no way of providing so I, I, we have, if we have no way of providing human waste disposal, I am afraid of legitimizing camping anywhere in the park. And I guess um, my question is, um, it, early in the proposal documents, it says the city does not recommend establishing a um, centralized camping location. We do not. And in my mind, that's a way to meet the, those kind of resource needs and mitigate their, the resource. It opens up a to the whole park. host of um, other issues. And, I'm, I'm, and so um, I am, um, I'm wondering if I can get a better understanding and clarity around why a centralized place where we could provide um, human waste disposal services um, would not be a, on the table. Yeah, fine. I, it's, it's a fair question and it's an honest question. So there's a lot of issues with having a uh, established campsite for a whole host of reasons. Number one, that opens everybody in those campsites up for a, a whole host of, that's an identified space where people are, that could be, anything could happen to those people. This is a vulnerable population. It is not a big population either. I, I want to make it very clear, I'm not talking about 200 people coming into this park and sleeping here. We'll get to it, Rob. We'll get to it, Rob. So, um, <laughs> We do not have, as the city, any social services. We have none. We don't have anyone who's trained to deal with this population. This population needs services um, hired by the city. Um, we, we need people, uh, we need to connect people to services. We don't have a location that is accessible for folks. It's, uh, we need it to be an accessible space. We need to be a policeable space. We need it to be um, a whole lot of things that we don't have resources for to support at all. And it only ghettoizes an entire community that is looking to camp for emergency reasons. Um, you know, one of the things that the state did um, when folks were kicked out of the hotel motel program is gave them a check for $2,000. And so now everyone knows that this population has cash sitting around. I'm very worried about that. And I would like Chief to sort of talk a little bit more about why this isn't an idea we support, but in, in general, I will say, we don't have a good accessible location, we do not have money for the services, we do not have trained staff to provide any services to these folks, and it uh, puts people at risk. It pe puts the people who are camping at risk, and that worries me very much so as, uh, as staff and as a person. Um, I will just sort of say again, I do not think that this population is gonna rapidly increase. We just needed a policy to address it um, because we don't have one. Um, people are doing this anyway. People are camping anyway. And Chief, do you mind talking a little bit about why we don't support one location? As, as Cameron had mentioned, it just brings again a host of other issues, you know, again, in lack of resources. And then, then there are the other legal bound issues in regarding to what the responsibilities of the city, what uh, you know, are going to be, what responsibilities, you know, that <laughs> it's just, it's one of those things that if you look at and you study other areas and other communities and talking to uh, some of my peers in other areas, you know, even looking at Burlington and some of the struggles and the challenges that they're having when they have um, uh, single spaces that have been identified, it's, you know, in, in essence, you're pretty much saying, here's your home. And so, so outside of any political concerns, any concerns from the public, um, and again, the, the lack of resources, I think uh, that that the councils, uh, that, that, that we as city staff want to focus on more long-term solutions rather than implementing something that's going to be <laughs> short-term and then having to deal with all the problems that are going to come associated with it to distract us from what the end goal was going to be. Which is state-supported services. And I will put this out there, so it's sort of petty of me, but I was asked by the state if we could host a campsite, an established campsite. And we said yes to that if they provided us staffing and money and that they didn't have that. So, so you know, that's at this point to me, it, it's, a, it's a hard sell for both the folks who, who don't want, or camping because they do not, can't either go to shelters for whatever various reasons they have for themselves or, um, 
you know, are forced to do that, I think that puts them at a disadvantage, and we don't, we don't um, condone that. I have one last question, unless you guys. Um, how, um, you said that the centralized location was problematic because it is not accessible, it is not policeable, and it does not have funds to support. I'm wondering how inviting people to participate in dispersed camping makes that dispersed location accessible, policeable, and funded. So what you're doing right now is, so I, I guess I'm trying to say is like, if we create a space, the city owns that space. That's our space now, right? This is our space, we can take care of it the best we can. I'm trying, this policy is really trying to just put up boundaries around what is already happening. So this is already happening and right now we have no response to it, we have no limits on it, and that's what the policy is aiming to do. If I may, I don't think it's the city, it's not the city justifying that this is something that we're advocating. We're advocating that you know we have designated spots. Right. I think it's just that us just saying that outside of not having anything, this we have it. nothing and we have no ability to even respond in the first place. Yeah, it's definitely not an open invitation. I, I, I hate that that's the, the, the message that's getting out. This is a response to things that are already happening. Yeah, exactly. um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for public comment. There is apparently a giant storm that's coming, so <laughs> that will control the end of public comment, I think. Um, and as we head into public comment, um, I'm going to call on people, please address your um, you know, questions. Um, suggestions, recommendations to myself for the full commission late. and not other um, <coughs> yeah. members of the public. All right. Do we, we want to proactively I, um, under the shelter? I want to first cool. note that you mentioned at the beginning that you were, you learned about this in, a, in an article. I think for the future, the good, it would be good to approach the entity that's going to be responsible for selecting or deciding what's a sensitive area. And there we, that way you can narrow down the scope of the map of this area we don't disagree and so i think that in that sense i don't think that people are saying those who advocate for a smaller area that we should have some sort of ghetto or that the chief you know what the chief was saying which puts the city in some sort of legal liability or you at least view it that way i think that just having a smaller area that is more accessible you know would have been would be i mean it's still up in the air what's going to happen right so maybe maybe there's a way to narrow down this area if that's what you're going to do you know? um, the other thing I think is that, that you insist on this uh, court case and I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, the city has actually talked to Boise because I looked into what they did and you know it was resolved and then the thing continued in court but basically they addressed some of these issues so uh, you know if, if we're going to be pointing out a case why don't we just you know, talk to them see how they how they handle it Thank you. Has the city talked to Boise? Not directly. Okay. Sir. Hi. Hello, Madam Chair. I forgot your name. Kasha. <coughs> hey, I'm Dave Bellini, everybody. How are you? <laughs> 42 years with the state. I just retired, and I've never dipped my toe into city politics. So watch out. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> people love me and hate me because I like to point out certain things. Look, if you're going to communicate this, that's a specious argument to point to Martin v. Boise. I read the 35 pages. I'm not a lawyer or a paralegal. But those are a different set of facts. The city council wants to do this. And it, you should just say so. The city wants to do this. They want this policy because they think it's the right thing to do. I could accept that more than somebody coming out that probably doesn't have a law degree saying we are compelled to do this by the Cuckoo Ninth Circuit, which has a lot of crazy decisions. And we're in the Second Circuit, which is much more conservative. So I, I, I could spend an hour on that. I could spend two hours on telling you things about this population, which I've dealt with for over 40 years mm -hmm. directly. Uh, I think you're a little, you're sort of putting the cart before the horse. I would say to the Parks Commission, at least for now, no, whatever your no means. I don't know how city government is structured. I would say no, it's not ready for prime time. You can always revisit it. I made a few comments that waste disposal. I understand what you're saying about congregate housing. Uh, I had one of the work crews that used to clean up Burlington's uh, 
problem, so to speak. You know, we used to take our corrections crew in, and they they were well intended. But the other thing is, I don't have any information about this. I don't know if you're talking about three people, 300 people, 30 people. That wasn't explained anywhere. Also, what are their backgrounds? I mean, I work for the Agency of Human Services. If you want to start mm -hmm. dipping your toe in this, you need social workers. We agree. Well, you, you agree, but you're not doing it. And so, but you're saying you're going to plug ahead anyway because it feels right. I'm, thank you so much for your comments. I just, we're short on time. Sorry, so I, I could go sure off Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm Carrie Brown. Um, I want to thank the city for developing this policy. I have read every single thing I can find about it. I think it's incredibly well thought out. Um, I, we can get into a lot of um, nitpicky arguments about what the Ninth Circuit says and what the law says, but I do think that primarily this is coming from a place of we have people right now, right at this moment as we speak, who have nowhere to be. And they are, some of them, camping probably right near us. And some of them are sleeping behind dumpsters and they're hiding and they have nowhere else to go. And this is a, a way for the city to recognize that this is happening. These are our neighbors, these are our community members, and that we're gonna respond in a way that is compassionate, that is welcoming, that says we care about our community and we care about what happens to folks. Is this a response to, is this an answer to homelessness? Absolutely not. Honestly, when I first heard about people soliciting donations for sleeping bags and tents, when the, when the end of the motel program was coming up, I, I was so appalled I could hardly stand it, that this is our response, that we're gonna tell people they should camp in the woods. It's appalling, and yet it's what we live with here in Vermont. This is the situation facing actual people. And so if they're gonna be doing that, then the city has a responsibility to have a response. You need a policy to, in order to, to figure out how to handle this, and then the longer term questions about what do we do about our community members and our neighbors who don't have a place to sleep, that's another big question that we really have to keep answering. This isn't the answer to that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. So, thank you. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Yes. How have you, the people who are homeless, have you polled any of them about how many want to sleep in Hubbard Park? I, I, that specific question has not been answered, but to answer the earlier question, our peer support outreach worker said probably around 20 folks have communicated to her that they don't have any other options. But do they want to sleep in Hover Park? I don't know the answer to that question. I think if you would ask them, they would probably want to stay in the hotel. Yeah, I, I don't well, think anyone no, wants to Do camp. they want to be in Hubbard Park? Because it's not really close to a store, to any resources. You're not wrong. Downtown. You're not wrong. They're not, it's not close to what they fear to what they would prefer, which is a bathroom at Bethany Church, uh, to NAMI, to, you know, you say we don't have resources. We do have resources. Well, I mean, Another way, they have, there are resources, but they, they have a place to go during the day. There, there are not sufficient resources, but there are resources. True. I and have worked with this population for a long time. Thank you. Okay. I saw a question right here in the back. Yeah, yeah and then uh, you're next. Alex Chernomaza. Uh, some years ago, I've done travels, and uh, I've interacted a lot with people who were on the line with being homeless. And uh, what I've heard from quite a few of them is there are Facebook forums where people discuss places where you can go to countrywide, where you can just go and spend time without anybody bothering you. So while I fully agree that we may help people who currently need help in our community, we may unex have unintended consequences, <coughs> where we suddenly may, may have uh, 50, 100 extra visitors coming to here just because it's possible. And if there is a policy that we are not approaching, uh, we wouldn't know that those are the newcomers who came here because they can. And I'm not saying this uh, to, in a sense, uh, to deny people who need help, uh, but at the same time, how do we do it without putting ourselves in a situation where we uh, and, uh, find ourselves uh, with, there's like 150, 200 more people suddenly around the, the park. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Two, two questions. So I'm curious what the Hubbard deed says when they yeah. donated the land yeah, exactly. to the city, whether yeah. camping was allowable yeah. use of what they wanted yeah. to have happen. And the second thing is, following up the last comment, is that you've got to expect that, I mean, the issue of homelessness is very significant, and we all need to be working on a bigger program and a more comprehensive approach in the city and the state, and no question about that. But you got to believe that the homeless <laughs> population of Burlington on Pine Street will say, wait a minute, we can go to Hubbard Park and hang out in Hubbard Park. It's a lot nicer than Boilers, Litton, and Pine Street. And there's nothing to say they won't, which is an issue in terms of number. My concern over Hubbard Park is the, the health issue here. There's n there are two outhouses, three maybe? I don't know, three outhouses, no public water supply, and you're going to have people living here crapping in the woods. There's already a tent set up last night over there that's been going on for two nights, so here they come. Um, and that's fine, but I think you ought to look at the areas that you picked and not just broadly say, Hubbard Park ought to work. And Hubbard Park. You know, you look at Dog River fields next to the sewage treatment plant that has bathrooms, that has water, that has access to them if it, the city would allow it. And there are other options in the city that you could place in proximity to wastewater. But to have people up here clearly not going to the outhouses because they're, they're camped on top of the hill or in the back of the area, they're not going to go to the outhouses. They're going to just go in the woods. And that's going to happen to a great degree. And that's a health issue. A serious health issue that the city can't just say, well, we'll get people to come and shovel it up occasionally. That's not going to work. So I guess my pitch to the park commission, who I think does have authority to say what can or cannot happen in the city parks, is look at it differently on Hubbard Park especially and try to find these other areas in the city which you've identified and see if you can disperse in a way that's least close to and access to public facilities. Um, you, I, I agree with these comments. Thank you. Um, I think that the storm is about to come. Um, and I am, um, it, am I correct that the city council is voting on this proposal tomorrow? Well, they're taking it up. Taking they're taking it up. It up. Mm -hmm. Okay. If and there's that, a motion, then yes, but it's a starting the conversation. Okay. So there's no guarantee that there's going to be a vote tomorrow night. Um, right, so I, I just sort of want to frame the conversation that we're we're sort of asking council to do is is this high sensitivity area side, not so much the staff response side. So the high sensitivity area conversation informs the staff response, but regardless of high sensitive area policy, we as staff still need to come up with a way to address camping. Has, has there ever been a analysis of public park in terms of sensitivity? I mean, I work with a lot of wildlife biologists and, and it takes hours and hours for someone to go around this park and identify rare plant species, habitat, <laughs> deer yards. That's not going to happen in five minutes. That's going to take a considerable amount of time before you're going to get any kind of detailed analysis of what's going on inside of this park. Maybe Alec already knows a lot of that. But. Um, I think I'm going, just with the storm coming, I think it makes sense for us to come figure out what, and we are over the time here a little bit, to think about what we need to do tonight as a commission in knowing that the city council is reviewing tomorrow and maybe focus on the high sensitivity issue. Um, are there suggestions that we have to amend or modify? I think that's what we're being asked. I, do you mind if I sit? No, please just start it like so. What's, what's the council expecting tomorrow from us? Well, I think that there's, you know, this is just up for discussion with the council tomorrow night. So, just like the homelessness task force. Excuse me, we're still meeting. We can, I'm having trouble here and over here, sorry. Just like the homelessness task force met last week and they, they moved it forward. They approved what was, my understanding is they approved what was presented to them to bring to the council, but they are also meeting again tomorrow, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there could be changes. So the, I, the, I think at this point the Parks Commission is in a is in a place where you could make a recommendation to to provide input to the council for the conversation. So yeah. it's not that it's a foregone conclusion that there will be a vote tomorrow night, 
but this is our first public com discussion around this policy. Right, like we're not precluding if you all want to say we'd like to take Hubbard, we'd add, like to add Hubbard to the high sensitivity area. That's what we're here to, okay. to, to hear from you all. And that's exactly right. right. Like you, whatever recommendation yeah. um, that is would come from you, just like it came from Homelessness Task Force. Or the Cemetery Commission. Or the who Cemetery asked Commission, who, who all had feedback on this. That it's our job as the council to then take all of that and then you know, decide if we're ready to move forward or if we need to um, go back and revise before we're ready to approve. One, one thing i just say is um, any policy we propose, sorry, Connor Casey, council? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Do you know who any, you know poli any policy we pass, I believe, uh, would be more restrictive than the status quo of how we practice now. Right now, based on the heart of the chief, based on what he says, you want to set up a tent, tent at Hubbard? You can, you know? There's no guidelines. There's nothing 50 feet from a trail or anything. This policy can be pretty nimble, you know? Nobody's saying that, okay, God, we don't need these resources. We do, we can't refine these as time goes on. But it says, we're dealing with a crisis right now. We got 70 people in Washington County. Their hotel voucher is drying up there. And we want staff to have some direction of where they can go, you know? And, and I, I would also like, I'm on the board of Mosaic. They would just say, you know, some of these folks are victims of sexual and domestic assault who have nowhere to go. And we're definitely not going to tell the police department to either arrest them and tell them to move on. So clarity would be helpful around the proposal. But again, the proposal is more restrictive than what we're doing now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what kind of specific recommendations might we have for the council in that case? I'm um, asking the other commissioners what specific recommendations we might suggest for the council to consider. Reject the whole thing and write it properly? I'm, I'm asking the commissioners, thank you. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, Again, the first time we heard about this was on the was on the 29th when the article appeared in BT Digger. That was, that was the first inkling. As far as I know, nobody else on the commission had any any communication whatsoever that this was even being considered. It was drafted and then and then submitted. Um, and so my immediate thought is, well, you know, homelessness is a is a issue that has to be tackled by the community. All, all we have to all do it together with resources together. And then the question is, well, do is in under, under the under those resources is one of those bullet points, public property probably should be considered. You know, do we use public property as a resource uh, for that? Um, I keep going. I said, okay, uh, our our responsibility um, as commissioners um, is to is to protect the assets of our parks, of our city parks, um, and. You know, our, I want everybody to realize that our questions and concerns do not come from any place of being uh, biased against homeless people. I think I speak for all the commissioners that, that you know, we, if, if there's a way that, that we can help and be a part of that, that we want to be able to do that. But I, I, again, and if Cameron has said uh, that we're, we're not going to solve the problem of homelessness sitting here at this table. Um, so... <laughs> You know, I, I, but I still have I have a lot of questions and concerns that I that I don't I don't, I don't know if they've been adequately addressed here tonight. Um, I am I, I Connor. I know I, I understand it's happening. You know, you're saying that it's happening now, and that you're right. Any any policy, a one sentence policy, would be more restrictive than what we have now. But this is an invitation. It is an invitation. Um, and so we're concerned, that's what we have to to so to the best of our abilities. We are trying to uh, anticipate those unintended consequences. That's what we're trying to do here tonight. Um, I don't, you know, we could probably sit here until the rain starts and and and, and pick apart the different parks and say this area might be okay, and this area might not be okay. I'm not sure how we go about that. I, don't, I mean, out of respect the, for their fiduciary responsibility for the parks, somebody should have at least. You know, I, I think that in the time, you can't just put it on them and say, decide now. Right. I, I'm inclined to, to let us chew on this for a couple of days. What's the soonest we can meet again without running afoul of public meeting? Tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow? Yeah. 
Like, no, 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 we have, we have to warn it. Oh. 75 <laughs> hours? <laughs> I mean, you can do an emergency hour. meeting or you have a 24, 24 hour special emergency meeting. Yeah. 48 hour regular meeting. Thank can you. we, can you guys squeeze that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that tomorrow? Well, I know. I well, probably through Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can speak from my own vote on council. I'm happy to not have this go to the vote tomorrow night. For sure, if you need more time to chew on this, I would I would ask that that you discuss it and, and not take action until we can at least weigh in on on the spaces. I, I think you know, I don't know that we have authority over what goes into the policy. I think it's really you know the city manager's right. office. Right. But but I think as far as what parks end up you know in this on this map, I would like to have the parks commission be able to weigh in before you vote on on yes or no. Well, my sense is that this is something that needs to be dealt with as soon as possible, but I don't see how we can how we could do that tomorrow night. Meaning, I think that there there needs to be conversation. It can't be can't be pushed off and pushed to a committee. I think that need, you know, folk, we need to hear from from you all. You know, from Ken, I know you guys are meeting again tomorrow. I think there's a lot of important voice, voices that need to be heard before we you know are. Um, making a decision on this so I agree with Connor that and if, if we need to if that means that you know the council we, we can do that as quickly as possible and then have a special meeting to be able to move forward then then that's fine as opposed to waiting to the next one because this is really an emergency just like Connor yeah, said so yeah um, yeah I, I think it's important that you all are heard and, and others and I you know I mean at least me I'm I'm prepared to, to have a special meeting so that we can you know give this some more discussion and probably a, a better setting <laughs> um you know as soon as possible so that way you can you know take your action as soon as possible i don't i don't want to leave you guys hanging but i do i feel like we you know we should be able to weigh in before something's decided um so special meeting on thursday thursday special meeting I... takes the 48 hour emergency meeting takes 24 hours. <laughs> well but it's it's eight o'clock now, or whatever. What time is it? Sorry. Seven. Seven. I'm Seven going to have a preschooler with me on Thursday just <laughs> to add to the mix. <laughs> like, what's the soonest we can warn it? <laughs> Do you warn me? Who does that? Who warns? It? What's the soonest we can warn it? Like, Mary does. The city manager's. Yeah. Eight a.m. tomorrow morning. That's the soonest. Okay. So it would have to be, it has to be Thursday. Okay. The emergency it has meeting. Has to be Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Hotel, hotel, ADM Thursday. Uh, no. Hotel, hotel, <laughs> that go through this month? You know, are those No, they're already done. It's done. So yeah. it was yeah. until July. Yeah. 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 There was a two week extension for folks with disabilities. Gotcha. Okay. So, so I, 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 six o'clock Thursday? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. It's and me. indoors? Do people meet indoors? I would. I would advocate. Do people meet indoors anymore? Does I don't. That... I would like to just pitch this again. It's an advocacy issue that I'd really like to um, talk to every commission about. Um, really like for folks to meet in accessible buildings inside so folks with disabilities or the elderly can come to these meetings. Sure. So it'd be pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, what room is that? Is it the police or the community room? No, you can do the community room. You can, can do the council, the council chambers. Let's do the council chambers. Yeah. Is this cool. not me... an accessible location? Not particularly. Okay. I thought that this, what, sorry. I don't think it is because okay. it has to be, gra there's a whole thing. It has it's to be gravel okay. and packed. It's, it's functionally accessible, but not legally accessible. Okay. okay. So Got where it. are the council chambers? Um, so I will double check so the booking go, go and help y'all notice that <laughs> ASAP in the morning. Okay. Go in the front. That'd be so great. Down the, actually, um, Frank's walked in. I yeah. Mean, all right. I'll take an emotion to ask for no action. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, I'll move that we table discussion on this uh, draft policy until our emergency meeting on Thursday, July twenty whatever twenty something. You know the fire department. And I will okay. All right. Have that be a leading conversation in my presentation to the council tomorrow. And um, as also in your motion, Dan, and you recommend that the council not take action until then. Is that? I think that's. A I mean, the council part. could take action if they want to. Right, I don't. But I don't I think we can recommend that. Still, that's right? fine. Yeah. So I, I move that we we table discussion on this draft um, response policy until our emergency meeting on July twenty second, and I ask that the city council refrain from taking 
action on on this policy until after we've made a final vote on complete Thursday. <laughs> Don't say that. You jinxed it. Come on, Andrew. Okay. Just be happy it's not. Just, yeah. um, yeah. Motion. I need a second. second. I second it. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. Yay! <laughs> Everybody come to all of our meetings. Please. We, we need more of an audience every time. Our parks, which are also very positive, so I encourage you all to come other times. Third Thursday of the month, 6 p.m. Well, it's been fun that we move around the sports. People will come. I'll invite the homelessness task force here and they can all all right, Blanchard survey. Yeah. Lincoln, can you give a quick update on where yep. we are? Oh, it's yeah. going to get exciting now. Go Man, we are in the <laughs> we're in the um, digital survey phase of writing a draft management plan for Blanchard Park. That is live out on Front Porch Forum. Um, there's already been like 40 responses, which has been great. 40? Yeah. Wow, that's and, awesome. Wow, that was just um, today. Then. That is incredible. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. fantastic. So that was I mean, I did 38 times. I did 38 of them myself, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I had to get rid of the multiple responses. So, um, that, that's good, and I think by early fall, there should be like a draft plan that we can then bring to like public comment. Um, to move forward with like a final draft and the you know the Vermont Master Naturalist project team that I'm on is meeting to m tomorrow at Blanchard to work on a survey of the natural resources and we're connecting with Aaron Marcus who's a neighbor of Blanchard and a botanist and then um, Richard Blankham's last name but we're getting some help from the surrounding folks to do the surveying and some of that stuff's already been done Sean Beckett sent us from North Branch Nature Center sent us like a plant uh, survey that was done like I think a decade ago but there is stuff that we're building off of which is interesting and probably good to think about going forward with these plants this you know surveys and plans have been done before and we just can draw on that for for the current ones so great. that's kind of where we're at it's, that's yeah. great yeah yeah good good work um thank you he has taken the lead, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you did. No, we know that. <laughs> Acknowledged. Um, I, what I do have is a list of the names and email addresses of the people who attended our field site okay. in yeah. Blanchard, and I will email it to that list. Great. Um, okay, excellent. We are on to the staff update. Um, hey, Alec. Alec? Alec. Alec, staff update. Staff update. Uh, um, including update on progress with the community survey, since he just talked about the Blanchard survey. You want to start with that? Sure, yeah. Um, first of all, um, I just apologize for not getting you my regular staff update. It's been a really busy month, so. Um, on my mind, I just didn't do it. Um, but the community survey has almost a thousand responses now, which is really awesome. That's, that is incredible. <laughs> we sent out 3,500 postcards, so um, I'm really pleased with the response so far. We have a last. We have one more mailing going out to all uh, residents with the water bill. There'll be like a little stuffer in the water bill at the end of July, so I expect to get another little bump there. Um, and we'll continue to throw it, but we we'll just run through. What's the going. deadline for that again? August 10th, I think. Thanks. And I, I, I yeah, there's, there's a lot of good info in there. It's going to be a lot to process. <laughs> so we should definitely uh, put that on our agenda for the fall. Okay. There's some written responses. Yeah. Um, we have been mostly preoccupied with uh, the Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps, which has been amazing. We had our first cohort of um, 16 uh, finish up their first three weeks, and we're just starting the second week of our second cohort of 20. Um, so we're running three crews, four days a week for the whole day. Uh, in three different locations around the city. Were these people down by the high school, yeah, cutting out all that brush? Yeah, wow. yeah, cutting the. That was impressive. Oh, so they let it dry. Is that what it is? 
Oh, no, they're chipping it. They're oh, just, okay. You know, we only chip it a couple times a week. All right. So. So, so they manage to avoid getting poison ivy. They're um, we're like suiting up and okay. and pulling the poison ivy proactively. You wow. Know? Yeah. That's commitment. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's yeah. not yeah. necessarily like a positive introduction to conservation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's weird. <laughs> Kids are loving it. That's great. We've had a couple get poison ivy. Um, but for the most part, um, it's been great. Yeah. They seem to thrive on the hardest tasks. We rebuilt this bridge here, which you can check out later in the meeting. Yeah, it's great. We've been working on stone wall up in the park. We rebuilt another um, bridge up in the North Branch Park. We've done a lot of amazing work with these crews, so it has been so great. I've seen them out several times. It's good. It's really yeah. great. Um, yeah. Probably the most exciting thing to happen was... Um, Bernie Sanders actually visited um, the Feast Farm project and met with our whole first cohort of, of youth conservation corps. Um, that project hits a lot of his interest areas, you know, the youth um, development and uh, seniors and food insecurity and, and sustainable agriculture. So we were having an event there, you know, a tour for the public, and, and one of his representatives was going to be there, and I guess he was around and he just asked if he could come. Um, so he came and we kept, you know, he wanted to keep it somewhat low profile so he could meet with the students, but he met with the NYCC kids and just had a little Q&A and talked about what he does. And it was really it's sweet. Great. That's, that's awesome for those kids. Uh, what else is going on? So you said another crew just came in? Or yeah. starting to? Yeah, we had two three-week sessions. So we're, okay. we're at the second, okay. we're in the second session now. So, gotcha. so we'll run all the way to the end of July. Okay. Great. Um, anything else? Great. Good update. Any questions or anything? Um, I think in an email I, I might have sent to the two of you, I'd asked, I, and I got this out of a, I think it was another Digger article about the, the VOREC grants and how there was a ton of money that got appropriated for that. And I'm yeah. wondering, I look back, I think at your most recent, or I don't know, it was one of the past two staff updates, and I think it said something like, you know, we're considering projects, but I didn't know if you'd gotten any further on, on whether we wanted to put something forward for one of those grants. Yeah, we definitely will put something forward. Uh, their letter of interest is August 27th, okay. so kind of like on the back burner until the end of July, but they're looking for big projects, you know, with 50000 minimum with no maximum, and they want to give out uh, $5.1 million to a uh, 25 communities, so it could be potentially a large project. <laughs> we have a lot of, you know, we have multiple projects that could be easily over $50,000, um, you know, that are basically ready to go. Um, it's just a matter of sort of like doing the work to sort through what's, what the best fit is and talking to partners. I know another one of their like scoring criteria is like um, regional partnerships, so kind of what I talk to. Spill or across from my trail or another community, um, River Conservancy. You know, we have a lot of projects that have partnerships, so we just got to figure out which one is the best fit and then submit a letter of interest. They actually have two grant programs. They they took the six million dollars and they split it into five million and one million. So the five million is like the economic development, you know, outdoor recreation. Oh, thank you. Um, grant round and then the one million is for like shovel ready trail projects that like couldn't happen because of COVID or got delayed and so you can submit to the house oh, no. and not a, um, uh, I would and for I just noticed the other day that there's a parking lot now by the uh, the pump track mm -hmm. which I was surprised about because I think when they proposed it we asked if there would be parking and we were told there would not be parking there and I was I don't know if you remember that, but I, um, I was surprised to see that there. I was wondering what's going on there. Um, there is parking there. It was part of the site plan uh, that was presented. I think it was presented to the commission, um, but I don't know for sure. I can't remember what their presentation was. It certainly was in the site plan that was approved by the planning department. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's parking there. Um, 
smaller than I thought it would be. Yeah, it needs a little bit of tweaking. The parking, the parking or the pump no, track? The, the pump track. I yeah. thought it would take up more of that space. Yeah. It's really kind of tiny. Uh, My yeah. daughter asks when we walk by, like, what is that? It <laughs> Get her looks, on it! <laughs> I mean, there, it doesn't, I mean, it looks kind of like a weed fest yeah. and dirt pile. Yeah, a lot of people use it. But it, it'll turn <laughs> into that. I mean, yeah. it'll, it, it'll, you know, where, where, the, where you do the pumping part <laughs> will stay dirt yeah and then and then grass will grow up everywhere else so it's, we actually yeah. seeded the outer banks with white you, yeah. clover as part yeah. of the work party so that's coming in really nicely and yeah it needs to be weed whacked you know we're yeah. really stretched in the summer so that's a good example of a place that doesn't get attention that it needs um, but yeah i i thought the parking was part of the plan for that i think it's a good idea um i think it needs a little tweaking as it is it's kind of tight in there how it's arranged but um, yeah, I don't, may, well, I'll look at the, I, I don't remember it being part of the site plan when we looked at, because I, I remember us asking about it, and we were told that there was no parking, and it, people would just go on the street there. So maybe it's a need, but I wasn't, I'm not sure, well, the whole thing was not approved by the commission, but parking specifically, I don't think was part of the plan that we reviewed. Um, so we carried out, you know, the, the our department carried out, like, executed a plan, I guess it must have been the planning commission that approved this plan, but it, it like had parking and then it had the 50 foot buffer. We planted over 60 trees in that site. Um, we created like a, you know, a 10 foot lane around the outside of it for access and then create, you know, protected but other parts with stones. So there was like a pretty detailed site plan that we, that we carried out, but I think a lot got lost in translation with that project between the various commissions and boards that it was presented to, so sorry about is, that. Is that whole space, I know you go down Cummings, it sort of ends, there's this driveway that goes left and then you can start on the bike path. Is that whole space where the pump track is up to that little driveway park park land? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All the way to the paved road that accesses the water and okay. you know, pumping station. I would be curious to see a site plan if it exists because I think when we voted on it, we said we support the concept contingent upon a site plan being developed yeah. and then never came back to the commission to actually approve construction of the pump track it just, and then it was just constructed. And so if there is a site plan, I would like to see it at least um, and the commission never approved that project, which I think is a pro problem. We never it's approved there, the pump track? No. We approved the concept of the pump track so that they could move forward with permitting. And we asked for a site them to come back with a site plan. A site plan was never developed and the so we never actually approved was, the project. It, it wasn't part of the North Branch MOU? No. Okay. Um, and it's there, I mean, and when it was shared with us, it was presented as it's just dirt, so if you don't want it, you can move it, right. which I don't think <laughs> is a very feasible, socially acceptable <laughs> solution. Um, but it is there, it's constructed, but it just, you know, I would like, I would just be curious to see the site plan if there is one, since we had asked for one. Sure, yeah, I can do that too. Um, anything else? I, I'm, that's why I'm looking at your um, uh, agenda. A any updates on the, um, on, on uh, uh, Trails, you know, new new trail proposals and or uh, the Heaney property. Um, Do so we need that, to go I'd into it? Have to be executive session, okay. but um, the um, trail proposal um, have had a number of communications with Mariah from Um I know that she's working on that trail design project, but um, I met with her before the last meeting and haven't met with her again. So I think she's just. On okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's the only public trail yep. iron in the fire right now. Yep. Yeah. And at the very beginning of the meeting, somebody had shared that there was um, issues with maintenance at the by the pocket park that need uh, by the um, confluence park that yes. needs to be power wash just so you know because I think you had stepped away Power wash mode what do you own do you have jurisdiction over the one on the 
east side of the bridge, the new pedestrian bridge. So the background on Girton Park, um, so just so we're all clear about what, what we're talking about here, Girton Park is the constructed shelter that's right across from the old pedestrian bridge. On the bike path. And then on the bike path, yeah. And then Confluence Park is like the green space that has a couple picnic tables on it that's, mm -hmm. you know, adjacent to the transit center. So there will be Confluence Park. But yes, that's the future yeah. location. Future of, location yeah. of Confluence yeah. Park. And what's the new one right across behind Savoy? The green space behind twelve. So main. that's just an empty that's lot. That's just an empty right lot right now. 12, 12 main, I think. Yeah. Is the no, behind it, behind the park, up against the river. It's five foot tall weeds now. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's just a you know, empty green space. Yeah, okay. it's not managed by anyone. Right. So. Um, Let's see, where do I start? <laughs> um, the Gir Girton Park, the structure, we, um, we were cleaning it last year and uh, twice a week, one, and once, often twice a week. Um, I, you know, I think everyone has seen that it has been trashed and pretty frequently. And our staff just had a lot of like really tough interactions down there um, and felt like was kind of a Sisyphean task, you know. Um, they were both like having really challenging interactions with people and also feeling like cleaning this place was completely futile. Um, in addition to like dealing with human waste and a lot of things that we're like, you know, not really equipped to deal with. Um, so there was a plan to move that, you know, to 12 Main, and we have applied for a number of different grants to move that that we haven't gotten. Um, and so it kind of fell into this limbo place where it was like, oh, the winter was happening and we had this plan to move it, but, but that never happened. And now the summer has started again and we're back to kind of like square one with Curtin Park, which is like, how do we deal with this? You know, it's obviously a, a really challenging spot. So we have a proposal in to, um, to Cameron and the Homelessness Task Force and Don, the outreach worker, to power wash the park every Friday morning. Um, and hopefully get assistance from people who hang out there to clean it up, thinking that like if we can chip in a little as a city and they can chip in a little bit as we use the park, we can come up with a more sustainable solution for how to keep it. Um, so that's in the works, you know, it hasn't, it's just, you know, people are busy and so it's very um, My recollection of Burton is that it was a, a volunteer group that got together to, to put up this shelter and that I don't know that the, the city ever actually sanctioned that space as a park. Are you aware one way or the other? Is it, if it's not a park, I, you know, part of me thinks, why should our, our staff be spending their time yeah. you know, dealing with it constantly? My understanding is that it was declared a park by the okay. city council. Uh, we'd have to go back in the records to before, before my time. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, I don't know the answer. To know that for sure, but I, I think that's what happened. Okay. Uh, and then Confluence Park, the future site of Confluence Park, is part of like a bigger issue, which we've talked about before, which is like we have this amazing bike path, but nobody delegated to take care of it, and so the Parks Department has kind of like been pulled in over time um, to to do things, and you know we we've done some great things like down there now we got a grant to have a crew you know the high school crew and a crew leader that's like all paid for with grant money because it's in the riparian area and we're able to manage it but we really need a sustainable solution to that which is like some money every year to like have people that can actually maintain that I, you know be happy to have it be our department if we have the resources to do it so that's like you know the whole bike path east to west including you know, the future Confluence Park site, the Moat lot, um, and, and beyond. So I, it's, a, it's definitely an, a really big maintenance issue, and we just don't have the resources to deal with it. And we do the best we can, but it's, you know, it's not great. And again, that's another place. It's like there's human waste there. There's, you know, drug paraphernalia there. Um, there's often people there who, you know, Abusive and belligerent people. Yeah, they have lots of challenging interactions in that stretch for sure for our staff. So it's 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 a tough. Day. Can I ask what Plan B is? Because can can you just say no, we're not, and let Public Works take it on? But it's not okay to leave it in limbo. It's it's a health hazard right now. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a plan B. Uh, I don't think Public Works is equipped to take that on either. I think it needs a, it needs a solid plan that's not just like leave it be. Or the health officer, fire job. chief, told me he that he had talked with y'all and Public Works and that it was going to get power washed last week. And then I saw your, your Public Works chief out there. He's making plans to move it. But in the meantime, that's not until somebody votes where to put it. Um, so. Do you, you want to connect on that? I just hear the storm coming, and I know I just walked here. I, I don't have any authority to set yeah, yeah. his priorities. You all do. So it, I'm just well, raising that as a thing that can't be neglected any longer. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. No, that's helpful, um, but I'm not sure we're going to solve it tonight. Um, so I just want to maybe move us along. Is there anything else in the staff update space? Do we need an executive session today? I don't think we really do. I don't okay. have any significant updates. Um, then um, I am going to propose that we adjourn by unanimous consent. <laughs> oh, so oh, I, not uh, unanimous. Just a, a couple, one or two minutes, um, <laughs> just so everybody's aware of, of what's going on. So I, I was a part of this um, discussion that happened last week with the, the group that came to our last meeting um, requesting a dog park. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of time spent sort of introducing, talking about experiences, people saying, oh, my gosh, I can't believe Montpelier doesn't have a dog park. We're this great capital city. So a lot of that. Um, but, you know, I, I think the next meeting is probably and then they, we sort of, you know, set up this very high level framework for like, you know, if, if we um, we being this group and I'm just sort of there more monitoring because I, I don't know that I have really a dog in this fight, but oh. <laughs> didn't even mean to do that. Um, but sort of setting up a framework for, all right, if we, if we identify places that could be good, how do we judge them? You know, what are the criteria? And so I think some of those criteria at a very high level were, were set out, and although I don't know who it would ultimately fall to to say, all right, does it meet this, you know, is it sufficient space-wise? Does it have, you know, this amenity, this amenity? Um, I don't know who that'll be, but that was sort of what we got through. And then at the very end, we sort of talked about different areas that would be good. And, and I one thing that, you know, I, I don't really want it to be in Hubbard Park. And I think I, you know, I made that clear at our meeting and I made that clear at this meeting. Um, but rather than saying not Hubbard Park, I sort of started pushing for Gateway Park. Um, and ultimately, I, I also made everybody aware that the Parks Commission would decide this. But in my eyes, Gateway Park doesn't get any use. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, it's a nice, relatively flat, open space. It doesn't have water. I think that's the one drawback. Um, but I think it's a site probably that could. probably could for potentially, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a site that merits some consideration for at least setting part of it aside. For, for the record, for can you fence. just point out where Gateway Park is? Not that we don't just, know. Just for, I just, just for the record. <laughs> Gateway Park, if you, if you drive out Route 2, you see the, if you're going towards Middlesex, you see the cemetery on the right, Greenmount Cemetery. On the left, right before you go under the interstate bridge. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Plot. There's actually yep. really good parking. Yep. Yep. It's okay. it's a nice spot, and it's it's big enough that I think... You could set aside part of it, fence it in for dogs, and you'd still have some space for people to, you know, picnic or do whatever they do down there. But I don't know. I don't really ever see anybody use it. I don't go by there that often, and maybe people do. I see a car there every once in a great while, but. Um, yeah, people fish down there. Yeah, yeah. So right. th I think that's, right. you know, I'm hoping to make this an easy, because I, I don't want to attend tons of these, you know, dog group meetings. <laughs> I'm hoping that, you know, we can sort of settle on this and, and then we can bring it to the yeah, Parks okay. Commission and think it through logistics or at least they can think through the logistics and then we can come to a plan uh, come to the Parks Commission with a plan I'm, um, I'm also this is nothing about nothing but I'm conscious of the timing here that we're I don't mean the rain I mean we're <laughs> you know we're considering whether or not we're going to let people in the park <laughs> and on the same breath yeah, are we, yeah, we going right. to set aside something special for dogs but not for, for homeless people to camp I'm just conscious of that that's we, all we treat well, them that's like a dogs. specific area what's that we treat them like well that's, that's just right I'm just conscious of that well and Alec also Optics, just shared you know. concerns of Gorton yeah. Park which is yeah. the population yeah sharing that we are not equipped to deal with yeah. the population that we are inviting here. Yeah. Um, I assume that their preference is to be in Hubbard Park, this group. I don't know that that's their preference. Okay. Um, I mean, it's certainly a, a central location. 
as opposed to you know Gateway, which is a little bit further out. Yeah. You probably have to drive yeah. to get there. Um, but I don't. I mean, you know, a lot of people use Hubbard, and yeah. a lot of people don't know where other parks are. In the, uh, you know, other than maybe yeah. North Branch, but a lot of people. I mean, yeah. just, so that might be a communications issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I just I think I just learned Gateway Park existed. You know, maybe a year ago, and I've been on the Parks Commission for several years now. So that's, I knew it was you know, there. Shame I, on Adrian there. and I, and we just <laughs> yeah. learned the name of Gateway Park. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also want to point out that, that Dan now. did yeah. really fantastic research on yeah. green print funding, yeah. which, which is I like the like like key you, thing that we need to like yeah. achieving our vision. I wish that were tonight's topic would be like, that's what we need to focus on as priority wise, I feel like. Um, so we'll talk about that next time. But um, I can I can add more research. detail. I, I think there's it's more really out good. there. That, I, you mean, know, I sort of great. limited my scope to Vermont, but yeah. I, you know, I, I'll look at other states and see where we can go. But, um, um, hopefully in August, we can talk about it. I thought of one more important staff update, which is that Parker Palooza has started. We're, we did the first one last week, which was actually the second one because the first one was rained out. Uh, and we have one on Thursday, which means I won't make it to the special meeting. Um, but uh, it's going great. First one, probably two or three hundred people came. Oh, wow. Really great. great. Awesome turnout. Great. And awesome show. Slip and sliders running and everything's great. That How do two or three people get up there? They just We parked them at the dog field and then they walked down the, That's what we do for that. Okay. Where is it? It's here. It's at the stage by the old children. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, that's awesome. Great turnout. Yeah. It's great. Good. Um, I am going to adjourn us now because I'm no longer walking. I'm running. <laughs> I can't um, you back to it. Happy to get you know what? I think.